Hi everyone, this is Federico with Cuddle and welcome to Laser Craft Fest 2023. I'm so glad you could join us. In this presentation, I want to help you take your laser cutting skills into the third dimension by learning how to make laser cut boxes of any size. I've been working with laser cutters for about 10 years and I've done all sorts of projects. Lately, I've been making a lot of things that involve mechanical movements and assemblies uh, with moving parts like these. And I've also spent some time with laser cutters in the classroom by making kits and teaching uh, high schoolers how to use it. And I can tell you, I still feel that making boxes is one of the most useful and satisfying things to do with a laser cutter. You can use them to organize things. Sometimes you can use them to make packaging or interesting boxes for gifts and they can often be the starting point for other projects. If you've never made a box before, don't worry, I think you're in the right place. I'm going to show you everything you need to know, and if you have some experience, I hopefully can show you some new tips and clarify some ideas. I know there are a few places where it's possible to get confused and frustrated, so I'll try to explain and demystify some of the weird terminology that you're likely to find. For example, what are finger joints? What is this curve thing people keep talking about? What about these calipers? How do I use them? And what kind of materials can I use? I'm also going to cover how to put the box together and whether you want to use glue or not. We're going to be using Cuddle's open box template to generate the files and also to guide us through the process. I'm going to put a link here where you can get to the template and you'll also find a list of supplies, some additional notes, and of course, a special promotion for those who attended this event. But I'm also going to show you how to get to the template from any web browser. We're going to focus on making a very simple box with an open top, but the cool thing is that that should teach you all you need to know to try all the other boxes you can make with Cuddle. If you've never made a box before, I really encourage you to make one, even, even if it's a tiny one. I promise you're gonna learn something if you try it. So let's get started. Quick note about materials. I think you can make a box out of any flat rigid material that you can laser cut. But I'm going to recommend that you get started with something like 1/8 inch MDF, sometimes called draft board, or 1/8 inch plywood. I think it's easy to cut, easy to glue if you need to, and the settings for those are a bit more forgiving. Sometimes I make boxes out of chipboard because it's very inexpensive, and if the box isn't gonna get a lot of abuse, it's kind of like fun to use. And you can also make boxes out of acrylic, but I think this is a more advanced material because it's a bit harder and it's a bit, it's a bit more difficult to get the right fitting and it's harder to glue, but it's totally possible. Cuddle is a web-based design tool, which means there is no software you need to download onto your computer. We simply need to go to a browser uh, window, so here I am, and then we need to type cuddle.xyz and this is the main Cuddle page, but for this project, we're gonna go to the templates section, which you'll find here on the top left corner. So I'm gonna click there. And if I scroll down, there is a section called laser cut boxes. And we're gonna use the basic free open box with finger joints. So I'm gonna click on that one. So once I'm on this page, I'm gonna scroll down to see all the different options. So here we have some options we can change. There is also an included video tutorial and some text-based instructions about how to use the template and an assembly view. But for now, we're gonna concentrate on these options. So before we go through all these different options one by one, uh, let me tell you how to change any individual number. So if you click on any number field and drag to the right, the number will increase. And if you drag to the left, the number will decrease. And as you can see, the preview updates here on the left. I can use this little thing to revert to the default. Alternatively, you can always click on any number and type the number that you want. So if I want five inches, I can simply type five and press enter when I'm done. So let's start with the first three dimensions up top. That would be the width, the depth, and the height of our box. As you can note, these are the outer dimensions. What that means is that this is the size of the box as seen from the outside. So for example, with the height, this would be the dimension between the very bottom surface and the very top surface. And something like the width and the depth would be the outside dimensions of the box, like between these two faces and between these two outside faces. So the outer dimensions are different from the inner dimensions in that 
the inner dimensions are the actual space we have inside of the box after we have accounted for the thickness of the material that we used. Uh, sometimes you want to make a box based on the inner dimensions. So just as a quick example of when would I care for the inner dimensions. So let's say I want to put these three mechanical pencils into this box. So I'm going to measure the longest one of them, and that would be 5.75. But I'm going to call it 6, so I can slide it in there comfortably. So I'm going to check my dimensions here, and I'm going to start increasing the width of my box. And let's see, when I reach 6, for the outside dimension, I can see that the inner width is still 5.75. So that's not going to fit, that's barely going to fit my pencil. So I'm going to keep on increasing it until I get a 6 inch inner width. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you want to put something inside of your box, and so then you want to be looking at the inner dimensions of the box. And sometimes you want to put your box inside of something else, like a drawer or another set of boxes. And then in that case, you would be looking at the outer dimensions of the box. So let's move on to the next option we can change. That would be the material thickness. Something I like about this kind of template is that even if I don't understand the description uh, for any of these options, I can actually start changing it and sort of get a sense for it here on the preview. And there is no risk because I can always click here and revert to the default. So here it says that the material thickness determines the height of the finger joints. A little explanation does help in this case. These are called finger joint boxes because the way the faces meet at the corners is a little bit like interlocking your fingers like so. So when we change the material thickness, we are kind of changing the length of your fingers. So if I make my fingers longer, you can see that they kind of uh, stick out past the faces and I could potentially also make them shorter. Lots of materials are sold or we refer to them as having a very specific number for their thickness. Usually a very rounded number like one eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch. But in reality, they're actually a little thicker or a little thinner. And this is totally normal and to be expected. And we can totally work with it because uh, we can measure exactly what it is if we want the corners of our boxes to look really clean. If we want the corners of our boxes to meet really nicely and be flush and not have the fingers poke out too much or be too little to hold, then we want to measure the material thickness with some precision. And I can show you how to do that. If there is any protective film or masking tape, you should remove it before measuring. Make sure you zero your calipers with the jaws closed before taking any measurement. Also keep the jaws of your calipers parallel to the material because if they're crooked like these, the measurement will be off. There is always going to be some variation on the thickness of the material, so measure different spots and pick an average. In this case, I ended up going with 0.125 inches. I think in general, overshooting your material thickness that is making the fingers too long is not really a big deal. And it can actually look cool, like in this exaggerated example. But making those fingers too short doesn't look great and might actually make the box harder to assemble. So when in doubt, go just a little bit higher. The next setting is called the curve or the curve compensation. And this is meant to help us adjust the fit between the fingers. In other words, it makes the fingers a bit fatter. And if they're fatter or chunkier, they just fit tighter. Curve is an old word that we inherited from woodworking of all places. And it refers to the groove that is left after cutting something with a saw. So for example, if you mark a certain dimension with a line on a piece of wood and then cut right down the middle of the line, then you're actually taking a bit of material out of the intended dimension. So the way woodworkers deal with this is that they just move the piece of wood to one side and then compensate that way. But the difference with the laser cutter is that we generally cut down the middle of any specific line. And the amount of material that is vaporized away by the laser actually depends on the specific machine, on the settings that you use, and on the specific material that you're cutting. So just as an example, I cut a single line on this little piece of MDF, and then with some magnification we can see that there is an actual gap left by the laser, and that gap is roughly about a 64th of an inch given the ruler I had back there. So if we were to set the curve compensation to zero, 
uh, like in this example, you can see how the fit is fairly loose. I can actually wiggle the two pieces back and forth. I hope that explanation clarified some things, but I do get it. Like figuring out this whole curve thing is kind of a pain at the beginning because it's mostly a trial and error process. That means you're going to have to cut several uh, pieces and then see if they fit right. So my suggestion is to start with the default uh, curve compensation then make a small box, something like a two by two, and then only cut like two pieces of the box and then see if the fit is right. And if it is if it is too loose, then you make the curve uh, higher. And by how much? A very tiny amount at the beginning. So for example, we can go from 0 0.07 to 0 0.08. So a very tiny amount, then cut another sample and see if the fit feels right. If, it, if, if you go too far and then the two pieces aren't actually fitting, then we would go down a bit. So instead of the default, we would go down by you know, 0 0.06 and then try it again. And this seems kind of annoying at the beginning, but once you find a number that works with your machine and the materials that you're going to be using, then that's simply the number you're going to keep on using in general. So I think it pays to uh, put the effort at the beginning and then all your box assembly from then on is going to be uh, really nice. I think the takeaway here is the reminder we wrote right under the curve value, which is the bigger the curve, the tighter the fit. So try and make a small box with the default curve, make some small adjustments until you find a fit that works. And that's going to serve you for months or even years to come in your box making career. The last setting to mention is the tab width. So I'm going to change the number to see what happens. So as you can see, the individual tabs here or fingers get bigger and smaller. And if I go even smaller, you can see that it, it accommodates it by making even more tabs per side. So the important thing here is that this is mostly an aesthetic choice. It doesn't change the fit very much. To change the fit, you would mess around with the curve. So in general, one or two tabs per side is sufficient and plenty for most boxes. And the thing to know is that you make if you make them too small and make too many of them, the box might be a little bit harder to assemble and the cutting times are going to be longer. But in general, mostly aesthetic. So don't fret too much over this particular choice. Once I'm happy with all the dimensions, I'm going to download a file that works with my machine. In my case, I'm going to be using a Glowforge. So I'm going to download an SVG by clicking this blue button. If you need any other format, you can always click this little arrow and there are other options that might work with your machine. So I'm going to move over to the Glowforge interface and I'm going to conveniently drag this file onto the canvas. Now that's uploaded, you'll see that I have two separate operations here. One is the labels and the other one is the outside cut of the boxes. So I'm going to cut the labels in my case to show you the assembly, but this is completely optional. So I'm going to make that into a score. And then for the cut, I'm going to make that into a MDF cut, which is what I'm using right now. And I need all the lines to look red, otherwise they are outside of the cutting area. So I'm going to select everything and then just nudge it down with my arrows uh, until they all turn red. That means the, that's going to be cut. And once I'm ready, I'm going to send it to the machine and then I'll, I'm going to show you how to assemble the box. On the template page, we made an assembly layout. So it's a diagram that shows you the order in which I like to put the box together. So I'm going to use these as a reference. One nice thing about figuring out the right curve value for your machine and your materials is that you can get to assemble your boxes with a nice press fit. That would be use the friction generated by the material itself. And that's cool because you don't have an additional step or have to get messy with the glue. I personally like to use wood glue in boxes that I know are going to get a little bit of abuse or are going to be in situations where there is some humidity variation that's going to make the wood expand and contract and over time kind of uh, take them apart. So I'm going to show you both methods. I like to place all the pieces like in the assembly layout and I like to start assembling parallel faces. So right and left go first because they're opposite to each other. And after that I do the back and then the front. And I try to press them lightly initially just to keep them in place. The last piece is probably the hardest one to place. 
so it helps to lightly tap it with a mallet until it sounds solid. Then I finish by tapping around whenever I see a gap. When I apply glue to a box, I like to concentrate on these major areas of contact. See how these two faces come together. In order to visualize all the spots that get some glue, I like to push all the faces while flat in the assembly layout and then mark these lines. And those are the spots where I apply the glue. Of course, I don't mark the lines every time, but hopefully this helps you see it at a glance. Then I like to spread the glue a little bit with a toothpick. And once again, I assemble opposing faces. So back and front go first and then right and left. After that, I like to wipe the glue on the inside corners and if any glue squeezes out, it's nice to give it a quick wipe at the end. Any leftover glue should dry clear so you end up with a nice looking box. If you haven't made a box yet, I really encourage you to go try one, even a little one with some scrap material you might have lying around. And if you were following along, congratulations on making your first box. I think it's really cool you took the jump. And I think learning some of these concepts like the material thickness and the curve is gonna serve you not only for box projects, but for any other project that includes some sort of like assembly or uh, part, parts that meet or connect with each other. The cool thing is that I think now you're also ready to go explore other more advanced boxes like this one with a hinged lid. Let me show you actually. So if we navigate back to the templates page, we can see that there is a whole category of laser cut boxes. So we were just looking at this one. You could also look at something like the hinge lid box, the one I was just showing you here. And as you can see, the concept is quite similar. Like we have the same width, depth and height dimensions and then the material thickness and the curve. So nothing much changed here, except this one generates an extra lid uh, component and it has a little hole here and of course this one also comes with a video that can help you assemble it. Let's look at another one real quick. So let's look at the heart shaped box for example. So this one doesn't quite look like a regular box but as you can see the concepts are also quite the same. So the, we have the width, the height, the material thickness and the curve and of course another video to help you uh, assemble it. So hopefully all these concepts will serve you well to assemble all sorts of different projects. So let's go back to the templates page here. One thing I need to mention is that the open box with finger joints template we were using for this project is always free. As you can see it has a little free label. And some of the other templates have a little pro label, which means that you need a Cuddle Pro account to use them. The cool thing is that we're giving away one free month of Cuddle Pro to Lasercraft Fest attendees. So please visit this link to claim your free month and please do it before the end of the event. So go check it out. I really hope all this information empowers you to go out and make your own boxes. I think it's really fun. It can be really useful too. And I hope I was able to show you a tip or two that might make the process a little bit more approachable. We are always creating new templates and tutorials at Cuddle, so please check us out on social media, particularly YouTube for the tutorials. And you're going to find links to all of that and more on cuddle.xyz slash laserfest, including that free month of Cuddle Pro I mentioned that you should go check out before the end of the event. So I hope you enjoyed the rest of the workshops and I would love to read any comments or questions you might have. We always love helping people with their projects. And thank you so much for watching.